Prepare yourself to enter the Matrix. Oh, also, stick around to the end of the video because I've got a really exciting announcement that I am very excited to be sharing with all of you, but that's going to be coming at the end of the video, so make sure you, make sure you stick around. I imagine right now you feel a little bit like Alice, tumbling down the rabbit hole. <laughs> I can see it in your eyes. You have the look of a person who accepts what they see because they're expecting to wake up. Ironically, this is not far from the truth. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know, you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it the moment you turned on your HBO Max account. That there's something wrong with the discourse. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. Do you know what it is? The discourse is everywhere, it's all around us. Even now, right on the side of this YouTube window, you can see the other videos that you can click. You can hear it when you listen to podcasts or when you talk about movies with friends. It is the wool that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. Unfortunately, you have to see it for yourself, and this is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You can take the blue pill, and the story ends. You end the video and believe whatever you want to believe, that Matrix Resurrections is simply a bad movie, a failed attempt at a reboot to a franchise that had its time. Or, you can take the red pill, and you stay in Genderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I am offering is an opinion, nothing more. Tumbling down the rabbit hole. <laughs> okay, so I'm assuming since you didn't click off and you read the thumbnail that you're taking the red pill here. Um, Actually, you know what? Uh, don't don't be taking pills from random people on the internet. That's just that's just a bad idea. Uh, regardless, yes, today I want to talk to you about Matrix Resurrections, the long-awaited and in some cases long-dreaded sequel to the much lauded Matrix trilogy. And it finally came out at the end of 2021. And oh boy, did it not seem to live up to expectations. The Matrix Resurrections is the kind of film that will go down in cult history because it is so laughably bad. Truthfully, I can't even say it's unenjoyable because I spent so much of its overly long runtime giggling over how jaw-droppingly misguided the majority of it is. And even with how rough it is, folks looking for that nostalgia will get exactly what they're looking for. Apropos explanations of original characters reincarnation by different actors mixed with sluggish world building and reflexive riffs on fiction, reality, and nostalgia. What's more, the action is routine. The sense of wonder is missing. The Matrix Resurrections carries on as if it has something important to impart to the folks looking to see cuts and mirrors and bullets in slow motion. There is action, but it seems remarkably old fashioned. While the movie may have made up some of its numbers on HBO Max, the movie bombed at the box office and the review scores were terrible pretty much across the board. And honestly, considering the legacy that this movie is coming from, it's hard not to understand the heated emotional reaction of this film, positive or negative. I mean, the original The Matrix is considered to be one of the best, if not the best, blockbuster action movie of its time or ever, revolutionizing and setting the precedent for all blockbusters that came after it. We take so much of what The Matrix gave us for granted today, from well-choreographed action, CGI environments, long-tailed marketing campaigns, teasing the idea of the film, and even a focus on philosophical sci-fi storytelling. Do not try and bend the spoon. That's impossible. Instead, only try to realize the truth. What truth? There is no spoon. Everything that came after The Matrix had to measure up to The Matrix. And still to this day, most blockbuster big budget movies still can't live up to even half the intelligence, visual brilliance, or just plain well-oiled storytelling that The Matrix set the standard for. 
It sequels The Matrix Reloaded and Revolutions, while reviled at the time of their release for their extremely heavy-handed philosophizing, extremely inelegant exposition, awkward pacing, and an overabundance of extended action sequences, have even themselves undergone a somewhat critical reappraisal in the last two years. While certainly they don't live up to the brilliance of the original, they have come to be respected on their own terms for adding much to the texture of the metaphor and ideas of the original film. And also, they've got Hugo Weaving overacting his goddamn heart out. <laughs> For that alone, we need to thank these films. So that, plus considering the ending of the Matrix trilogy seemed to be a definitive conclusion to the story, as well as the fact that we live in a world of cash grabs, nostalgia bait films that just seem to be trying to grab our attention by just going, Hey, you remember that thing that you liked? Here it is again! There didn't seem to be much to justify Resurrections. And so, most of the internet seemed to agree that this movie was complete and utter dog shit. It was terrible. So bad I don't think the Wachowskis are capable of making anything decent. Everything they make bombs except the original Matrix movie. Also, why wasn't Lawrence in the new movie? Yet they used plenty of older footage of him. It was 2.5 hours of callbacks and fan service. They used clips of the previous movies and said shit like, here's scenes from your video game. It was a poorly written pile of shit. I would rather gouge my own eyes out with rusty spoons and walk into the ocean than watch this movie again. How about... I give you the finger, and you give me my phone call. However, there seemed to be a certain uh, undercurrent to all those comments about the movie. A certain feeling underneath that anger and vitriol, something that felt a bit more sinister than it would initially appear. Trans people have the skill of making everything about themselves. It has nothing to do with gender dysphoria. Don't ruin another franchise for everyone else again. I can't believe the liberal media has spun the classic movie, The Matrix, into being a trans allegory, all to satisfy their woke agenda. Smack my head, I will not be watching this pandering new sequel, The Matrix Resurrections. Can't exactly put my finger on it, but, um... Trans people made it. Oh, that's why it sucked. To be clear, I do think there are many fair criticisms of Resurrections, and I totally get people not liking the movie, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Yet I also feel that much of the discussion about the movie missed a ton of what this film was trying to say. And then, of course, there was also the even worse ones, the constant refrain of this movie being woke, as well as a ton of transphobic backlash to this film being simply made by a trans director, and on top of that, some considering it to be a trans allegory, which, oh boy, we'll talk about that. Anyways, sorry, uh, yes, having seen the Resurrections myself, though, I just can't get it out of my mind. In the year 2021, where the only movies that got any attention due to the pandemic were big franchise films like No Time to Die or whatever the latest Marvel movie was in the theater, the one that stuck with me the most from that year is Resurrections. Because like Reloaded and Revolutions before it, I feel like Resurrections is a movie that has a lot more to say if you look beyond the surface. If you look past the expectations and initial reaction. Because I feel that this movie gave us exactly what we were expecting to see. And yet, as if it was a dark reflection of itself, it was a movie that used its self-aware meta-nature and its place as a film trying to live up to that legacy of the Matrix films, as well as its nostalgia-baiting mandate by the corporations involved in making it to actually comment on all of those dynamics, not only in the film, but as The Matrix did before it, the very society and system that we live in. How despite briefly realizing that we were in The Matrix and getting to escape it, like Neo, we once again have taken the blue pill and fallen back into a new Matrix. One that recognizes its failures and chooses to ensnare us in a new way yet again. Today, I want to explain why The Matrix Resurrections is not only great, actually, but it's a necessary and important film that all of us need to heed.
before we jump down the rabbit hole, it's time for a word from our sponsors within the Matrix. Have you ever wanted to just download information into your head? Well then Skillshare is the right place for you. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creators where you can explore new skills, learn how to better approach your passions, and build your creativity. Basically, it's like downloading Kung Fu right into your brain. Except for its knowledge and cool experts. As many of you know, I've been working on my personal essay writing with Skillshare, and the latest one that I found incredibly helpful is Creative Personal Writing, Write the Real You with Ashley C. Ford. Taking Ashley's class is like taking the red pill to discover who you really are through writing, and I can't recommend it enough. But even if those classes aren't your jam, Skillshare has a class for you. It's curated specifically for learning, meaning there are no ads and there are always new premium classes being offered so you can stay focused and keep finding new ways to expand your creativity and break out of the matrix. And the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description, you know, down there, will get a one month free trial of premium membership. So thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video and with that said, let's jack back in to the Matrix Resurrections. <clears throat> All right, um, let's begin at the most obvious place, the film's meta-narrative. Resurrection's entire first act is devoted to a sort of weird meta-take that seemingly attempts to recapture that mind-bending concept of the first Matrix. What the hell? Now, the idea that our reality is not our own seems kind of quaint now today, given that we live in a world where multiverses are the hip new movie concept and Mark Zuckerberg is forcing us all to join Meta so we ignore the artist formerly known as Facebook's horrific effect on society, but back when The Matrix came out, it was actually kind of a crazy idea. Whoa. So Resurrections being that sort of nostalgic bait film is seemingly trying to recapture that same magic of the first film by placing us into a new world where suddenly we seem to be back in a new reality from the start of the original Matrix. Despite having seen Neo fight Agent Smith and literally die at the end of Revolutions, now, in this movie, he's Old Man Keanu, living in the present day as an esteemed video game programmer, a man who actually created the Matrix movies. Billions of people just living out their lives. Oblivious. I always loved that line. You wrote that one, yeah? Yeah, the Matrix movies actually exist in this universe, but this time as video games. By the way, I love that we actually see scenes from the Matrix movies in this new world as if they were part of the game, but given that they're live action, it kind of implies that the Matrix games were like FMV games, which, God, I wish we actually lived in that world where the lovingly cheesy FMV games became the norm. I, 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 want, I want FMV games to come back. I want them to be a thing again. I'm escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. Space! Regardless though, this is kind of a trippy idea, right? I mean, if this world is real, did the events of the original Matrix trilogy even happen in this new movie, or are they just video games? It immediately throws you off and makes you unsure of what to expect, exactly like the original Matrix did. What are you talking about? What? What is happening to me? We're left questioning the fundamentals of this reality being presented to us, even with our awareness of the entire concept of the Matrix and the plot of the original Matrix trilogy. But it's not just the vibes that this movie is attempting to cut and paste from the original Matrix, but almost directly wholesale copies scenes from the original movie. The opening scene of Resurrections is quite literally a recreation of the opening scene of The Matrix, but this time with slightly different actors but everything almost goes exactly the same. And this is where I feel many people started to get the vibe that Resurrections was nostalgia bait, quite literally going, hey, you remember that thing that you liked? Here it is again. Except there is one important distinction this time. Someone is watching. A person named Bug, who we'll learn more about a little bit later. But something is happening here. Something important. But Bug is observing and commenting on the scene, reflecting on it in the same way that we would be re-watching that scene in our own homes. And then, then she runs for her life. Are there any agents? We know the story. This is how it all began. We are observing someone observe the movie. 
were immediately placed into the role of a movie spectator, were made to identify with a movie spectator, making us aware of our own sense of distance from the movie that we are currently watching. We're being made aware that we are watching a movie because we're watching someone else watch a movie. And as a result, this causes us to distance ourselves from the film and it forces us to recognize our existence as viewers, as well as recognizing The Matrix as a work of art within this new Neo's world. We're immediately asked to reconcile with what we're watching as a work of art, as something made, as an artifice, not a reality that we can invest into. We're immediately thrown out of a movie, unlike most movies where we're asked to invest into it. Most blockbuster movies ask you to invest in the world, to fall into the screen, to fall into their matrix. Resurrections is intentionally telling you to recognize the screen and what you're watching and recognize that you are watching something and recognizing the movie's place in a context as a sequel to other films on top of that. Resurrections is very clearly wanting you to be very conscious of the fact that you are someone watching a movie and even more so a movie that is in context with other movies. It does that right from the beginning of the film. I know the story. The movie is quite literally trying to beat you over the head and say, hey, do not invest in this world. Recognize that you are watching something and think about it. And this idea in film theory is known as distanciation, where a film intentionally asks a viewer to recognize themselves as a viewer. Yet even this may not seem entirely novel for a movie concept. Audiences have been getting fourth wall breaking movies for a while now. Take for example movies like Deadpool, where the main character is well aware that he is in a film. Bang! Well, oh! Oh, hello. I know, right? Whose balls did I have to fondle to get my very own movie? Yet, if we look at how the discussion around Matrix Resurrection's meta narrative has gone, it feels as if audiences have been trained to talk about meta narratives in film as an end unto themselves. As if the entire point of a story being meta and fourth wall breaking is simply to recognize the fact that the movie itself is aware we are watching it. I mean, that's basically what Deadpool was, a movie that just poked fun at the fact that the titular character was in on the joke that he was a film character and making fun of the tropes and different concepts that came along with making a superhero movie. You gotta do a superhero landing. Wait for it. Woo! Superhero landing. But The Matrix Resurrections is actually doing something more than just making you aware of the fact that you're watching a movie with its meta narrative. It's using its meta narrative not as an end unto itself, but a means to an end. Now, the reason for this, it may seem entirely obvious because the entire first 30 minutes of Resurrections seems to be a meta reflection on Resurrections as a sequel to the Matrix trilogy. We literally have Neo being asked to make a sequel to his classic trilogy of games, even name dropping Warner Brothers as the ones in charge of making that mandate. I'm sure you can understand why our beloved parent company, Warner Brothers, has decided to make a sequel to the trilogy. One? They inform me they're gonna do it with or without us. I thought they couldn't do that. Oh, they can. I mean, you can't even get more meta than that. This seems like an obvious reflection on Lana Wachowski coming back to make this movie. Warner Brothers have been trying to make a new Matrix movie ever since Revolutions ended, and it asked the Wachowskis every single year to make another one, to which they said no. Eventually, they even considered making one without the Wachowskis. But finally, one of the two of them, Lana, decided to come back because the movie was going to be made without her either way. So she might as well come back and try to do it herself instead of letting someone else take it over. But like Lana, Neo in the movie isn't interested in doing the same thing again. But that's what Warner Brothers wants. They want the same exact thing regurgitated over and over and over again to make them money over and over and over again. But Neo and Lana didn't really want to do that with a sequel to the game. But that raises the question, how do you continue off of something as groundbreaking as The Matrix? As I said before, the original Matrix revolutionized blockbuster cinema on its own. Not only was its action simply amazing with its fighting sequences telling full stories on their own with a clear beginning, middle, and end to a character arc within those scenes, as well as pioneering so many martial arts and visual effects that we take for granted today in our blockbusters, but its story was one that on its own was mind-blowing in its exploration of the ideas of the singularity, the nature of our reality, our growing anxiety about technology, as well as having a solid character and a love story at its heart. And yet, what's even more amazing about the film was how, in the over two decades since it's released, how it has continued to be explored, picked apart, and discussed through numerous lenses, analyzing its metaphors, hitting meanings, and intentions. The Matrix was lightning in a bottle. 
So, how in the world do you actually follow that up? Well, a Resurrection addresses that head on with jokes and commentary about the very process of making a sequel. Lots of guns. Matrix means mayhem. Mindless action is not on brand. She's right. Matrix is mind porn. Philosophy in shiny, tight PVC. Yeah, ideas are the new sexy. And ultimately, the answer is you can't. You can capture that lightning again. We need a new bullet time. We need to revolutionize gaming again. Revolutionize gaming again. Again. This movie, Resurrections, is fully aware of the fact that it will not be another The Matrix. And so, by pushing us out of the movie, and asking us to recognize this movie's place within its legacy, as well as acknowledging the circumstances under which this movie was made, it's telling us to recognize what we all already knew going into this movie. That this movie will never be able to be and have the same impact as The Matrix. But. If that's all this film was doing, asking us to reflect on the fact that Resurrections can't change the world or shift our perspective like the original movie did, then I would say that this was just a lazy idea, saying, eh, I can't do better, so whatever, we're just gonna make fun of it and then be done. But this is actually just the starting place of Resurrections. Resurrections is priming us to understand not only the context within which this movie was made, as well as how it connects to the original films, but how it connects to the message of the original films, which was never really just about just technological anxiety or making a really cool action blockbuster, but about a much larger, more insidious system. Now, certainly, The Matrix was about technological anxiety. It had ideas of the singularity, for example. The idea that humanity will one day make technology that will make us obsolete and therefore will die out or be killed by these new machines. That certainly was a big part of what made The Matrix resonate with so many people. Yet, the Terminator movies had done this before, so what made The Matrix so special? It couldn't have just been that. Well, The Matrix also addressed that we were all living in a simulation, but that was something that was also addressed before. Something in movies like Tron, for example, had discussed the same idea that we could all be living in a facsimile of our actual reality. So again, I ask, what made The Matrix movies so resonant? Well, I think one of the reasons that The Matrix and its sequels were so powerful was that it was actually addressing a bigger underlying anxiety that we were all feeling at the time that it came out. And it was angling towards addressing the ideas and problems that we were all feeling under the system of neoliberal capitalism. Alright, alright. All right, all right, all right, I hear you. Now look, I know just even stating that is splitting my audience here. Half of you, I know, probably are already nodding your head along with me being like, yeah, we kind of already knew that. Well, the other half of you are like, why does this have to be about politics? Why does this have to be about capitalism? Why does it have to fit your agenda, Jesse? But I ask you, if that's your reaction, please just roll with me for a little bit. Certainly, I am not the first to say that The Matrix addresses capitalism, so I'm not exactly saying that I'm saying anything new here. But uh, let me just express some of the ways that I think the original Matrix movies does address the idea of neoliberal capitalism. I can't go over every aspect of the original Matrix because that would make this video hours long and I'm focusing more on resurrections, but The Matrix was a film about a system in which we are all made to think of it as natural, normal, and just part of our everyday lives. We work for it every single day, and we are being used as batteries even when we're not at work, even when we're at home. Every aspect of our lives is made to devote to this system. Our labor, our life, is seen as only being useful to those in power as a way to help keep that system running. Because every single employee understands that they are part of a whole. Thus, if an employee has a problem, the company has a problem. And we are told and made to feel that is the only way that it can be, even if we feel inside that that's not the case. Either you choose to be at your desk on time from this day forth, or you choose to find yourself another job. That ain't a choice. Now, I think in a post-pandemic world where so many of us are starting to realize that once we strip away the few outlets of life that we have outside of work, we recognize how much of work is not an extension of desires in our life, but made to just feed a system that we don't feel much investment in or get much out of but only done for those in power to keep making more money, 
to keep holding on to their power. A lot of us are doing jobs that we just don't feel are extensions of what we want to do with our life, but something that we are made to do, are forced to do, and just are making money for those in power. A dynamic I spoke about at length in this very personal video that I'm really proud of called The Nature of Work that you should also check out if you have the time. That all the money, the energy of our labor gets hoarded by the few, and we are told that this is the way it's supposed to be. As Margaret Thatcher was famous for saying, there is no alternative. A phrase she liked to use to signify her claim that neoliberal market capitalism is the best, right, and only system that works, and that the debate is over on the matter. Not to mention, if you look at the color coding of the original Matrix movies, the Matrix was green. Yes, green for technology, but also green for money? Greed? Now, there's also a ton of other things that we could talk about with the Matrix when it comes to a capitalist metaphor, but I hope that at least brings to light the basic idea of the film. And by the way, if you don't want to take my word for it, I'm not the only one that says the Matrix is a metaphor for capitalism. The Matrix was born out of a lot of anger and a lot of rage, and it's rage at capitalism and corporatized structure and forms of oppression. The entire point of the original Matrix movie was about recognizing this system, that it exists, and coming to recognize that not only is it not natural, but there are ways to push out of it, to break out of it, to resist it, to live life in a different way. And for many people who watched the original Matrix movie, it left us with an energy, a desire to rage against the machine, rage against the system, as it were. Yet what do you do with that energy in a system that feels so overwhelming? The original Matrix told us that we were all the one, but we had nowhere to go with it. And even so, when you recognize a system that you're living in, how do you react to it? How do you escape the Matrix. The entire point of the original Matrix trilogy was getting us to have this energy to fight back, to push back, to destroy the system, and yet many of us didn't know how to do that. Many of us didn't know exactly what to do with that energy, that inspiration that the original movie gave us. And that, that is the true interrogation and question at the heart of Resurrections. By taking us outside of the original film trilogy itself and Resurrections itself, Resurrections asks us not only to reflect on The Matrix's nostalgic legacy, but also to ask, what is the film's legacy in light of what it was trying to say? As well as how larger culture has reacted to capitalism since The Matrix came out, and how we have continued to both perpetuate it resist it, or actively support it in the years since The Matrix released, and where all of those things have pushed us to extremes. The first reaction we encounter is in Neo himself. We learn that Neo in this world, after creating the Matrix games, believed in the game so much that he started to believe that he could fly. So much so that he literally walked off a roof as a result. He was a visionary who saw the world in a brilliant new way, but believed it so much that he nearly killed himself and everyone else started to question his sense of reality. You can, you can think of these crazy new worlds, but you can't actually live in them, Neo. You can't actually survive in them. They're only in your head. These utopian visions of the future. These powers that you think you can have. That's where we see Neil Patrick Harris's character as his therapist come in, constantly questioning Neo's reality, and constantly questioning his idea of himself as someone who could see these other realities, and making him think that he is still stuck in this simple reality that he currently lives in within the Matrix. You feel like you can talk about it? When we started working together, you had lost your capacity to discern reality from fiction. You came to me after trying to jump off a building you said you wanted to fly away. When we actually know, as we see later on in the films, that Neo actually was the one. He actually could do all of these things. He actually could fly. Man, it's Keanu damn Reeves. He is Neo. He is the one. Yet here he is now. He thought he was the one, but he didn't bring down the system. He just ended up hurting himself, and so is now questioning his entire sense of self as a result. There's nothing wrong with that. It's what artists do. But it becomes a problem when fantasies endanger us or other people. We don't want anyone to get hurt, do we, Thomas? He thought he could change the world, but maybe he didn't change anything. But there were some who played the Matrix games in this world and reacted to it that had a visceral reaction to it. And in our real world, the Matrix was a film series that many people loved and adored. Yet, 
It was also a film series that was clouded in metaphor, one that didn't make its metaphor entirely obvious and therefore missable. As I said, many people out there did not recognize that The Matrix was a series about capitalism. And so we also see this reflected in Resurrections as well. Jude is a co-worker of Neo at his gaming company, who constantly likes to reflect upon how The Matrix games made him see the world differently, and is justifiably a fan, no doubt, and understands the themes of technological anxiety of the works. The first time I played the trilogy, I was shook. The paradox between free will and destiny. Are we all just algorithms doing what we're supposed to do or can we escape our programming? But he does not seem to have any larger recognition of the themes and ideas that could be read into the games. And this is a common dynamic with many films. And this isn't a judgment by me, but there are many films that are shrouded in metaphor where the metaphor is often missed by the viewing audience just going in to see a fun movie. Many of us are trained to take films at face value. Unlike books or other things, movies are more of a passive medium. Books, you have to actively sit and read them, but with movies, it will keep going whether you watch it or not, invested or not. So reading deeper into a film isn't a muscle that many actively have been trained to build. Again, not a judgment, but it's clear that some of the subtextual readings of The Matrix were missed by many in the viewing public. And Resurrections is actively trying to get us to push on that, because it obviously sees Jude as a problem, one that we'll talk about in just a little bit. Total effort. Milf. Daggers. Look, I'm sorry. I'm a geek. It's raised by machines. Maybe you should go. Yet, there were some people who saw something entirely different in the Matrix movies. And in recent years, the Matrix movies have been gaining a new appreciation as a transgender metaphor. Now, it's easy to see why people started to think this. I mean, both Lily and Lana Wachowski have both come out as trans women in the years since The Matrix came out. So it seems a very easy thing to do to just reclaim The Matrix movies as a work of transgender art, something that we are kind of putting on the movies after the fact. But even both of the Wachowski siblings have come out to state that this was in fact the intention of the film. The bubbling, seething rage within me was about my own oppression that I was forcing myself to remain in the closet. I'm glad that people are talking about the movies, um, the Matrix movies uh, with a trans narrative. I'm glad that it has gotten out that, um, you know, that was the original intention, but the world wasn't quite ready of, at a corporate level. The corporate world wasn't ready for it, so. Now, some people claim that this is just the directors trying to repurpose the Matrix after the fact to be a trans allegory, one that wasn't their original intention to begin with. But I do think there is actually clear textual evidence of these films as transgender readings, something that many, many critics and people coming into looking at the films in years since have found and appreciated. First and foremost, there's the obvious reading of the film. It's about living in a world where you are forced to live one way, but start to realize that something feels off, something feels innately different about you, and you don't really exactly have words to comprehend it or put it together. <laughs> you ever have that feeling where you're not sure if you're awake or still dreaming? Not knowing and adhering to the expected gender norms of what I was told to do, which was how to be masculine and how to present myself, how to be attractive and just abide by the rules. Uh, it's easy to follow these things when you're happy, and I was definitely happy being a man. It's just there was things that were off. That's the beginning of the process, which is starting to notice that things feel a little off. But then you have someone come in who represents that life to you. You get to see representation of that life, and they offer you a chance to have a new body. Give yourself a new name and a new way of seeing the world and reality of breaking through the systems that you thought you had to be confine yourself to your entire life. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind. And he does this all through the use of pills, which, by the way, at the time The Matrix released, estrogen pills were red. There's, so there's a clear analogy to see Neo as a trans woman. And there's numerous other parallels that we could talk about as well. I mean, there's the fact that Agent Smith is out there dead naming Neo all the damn time. Mr. Anderson? My name. 
is Neo. There's also the discussion of the original intention for the character of Switch in the original Matrix movie. We had, you know, the, the Matrix stuff was all like about the desire for transformation, but it was all coming from a closeted point of view. And so we had the character of Switch, who was like a character who would be, you know, a man in the real world or and then a woman in the Matrix. And, you know, that's both were... <laughs> where our head spaces were. I mean, hell, the end of the Matrix literally ends with us going in between the ones and zeros, in between the binary code, and in between an M and an F symbol. I mean, it's not exactly subtle, and it's definitely there. Oh, also, brief little sidetrack here, but can we talk about how Keanu is the most heartwarming cyberpunk warrior of all time? What do you think happens when we die, Keanu Reeves? <laughs> I know that the ones who love us will miss us. And also, he's like a low-key socialist, and I am so here for it. I don't know, it depends. I mean, if we're talking from a capitalistic platform, you know, I think it's always going to be portioned, and I think it's always going to be sold. Um, so it's just more things to sell. I mean, I'm sorry, more things to create. Oh, I'm sorry, more things to sell. So like, look, I know he's a cis man, but Keanu, you're part of the trans community. We love you and, 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 and we accept you as one of us. You're breathtaking. I don't like stand culture here on this channel, but there are a few exceptions. Leonard Nimoy, Stacey Abrams, the developers of Rare between 1995 and 2001, and Keanu Reeves. These are the people that we stand here on this channel. And I could go over numerous big and small ways that the Matrix movies create a transgender metaphor, but I want to focus in on one specific interesting way that a lot of people don't talk about when it comes to the Matrix as a transgender metaphor, and specifically because it will relate to our discussion on Resurrections. How the Matrix trilogy took the visual language and coding of transgender cinema throughout the ages and took it into the Matrix and subverted it for its own usage and then took that and used it to make the transgender experience a much more universal, relatable experience to everyone, not just for trans people. And the way that we can see that most specifically is through the use of mirrors. In many films about transgender people, mirrors are easily one of the most common imagery used to note a trans person studying their own body. In these movies, a trans person will stop and stare at themselves in the mirror, taking on the aspect of both the gazer of their own body and object of the gaze. In most works of cinema, the audience is assumed to not be transgender. So when you have a transgender protagonist in a film, they will often go and look at the mirror in order to look at themselves, to see how different, strange, or other they are to recognize their body as something different than what they wish it to be. In a way, they become both the audience watching the movie staring at their body and also are at the same time the thing that the audience is looking at. They become both gazer and object of the gaze. And that's why the mirror is so powerful because it allows this relationship between being the gazer and the object of the gaze to form. This relates to a male gaze in cinema. Now, most people, when we think of the idea of the male gaze in cinema, we just think of like, oh, look, it's uh, women being objectified and ogled by the camera. But the male gaze in cinema is, is kind of a much deeper concept. It does kind of pertain to that. But the idea of the male gaze in cinema is the idea that when a camera is being used in a movie, it is assumed that the camera has a male viewpoint, that it is a straight male viewpoint, to be specific that the camera is looking at women within the world of the film as something different, as something other, as something as an object that is different from the camera's assumed viewpoint as a straight guy. So when we look at women in movies, they're supposed to be a spectacle, something different, something strange than what we're supposed to perceive as sort of the norm of maledom. This isn't necessarily to say that every woman in a movie is sexied up or has to have, like, have their boobs hang out for it to be the male gaze, but just that women are seen as other, as different. Let me give you a quick and simple example to show you what I mean when I'm talking about the male gaze. Take this famous shot from Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo. Here you have the camera honing in on James Stewart's character in the crowd. Then he looks over and the camera follows his look and we see Kim Novak's character looking beautiful in the crowd as well. 
It's very simple and subtle, but look at what happened. Both characters are technically in the scene at the time that we enter into it with the camera. But the camera finds the male character first and makes us identify and understand him as the protagonist. Then, when he looks, the camera mimics his movement, following his lead, associating the camera with his agency and control, his gaze. So when we see Kim Novak's character, the beautiful girl, we're aligning that looking at her with his look. And so therefore she's seen as other because the camera has now been associated with the male character. So at the same time, the camera, the character, and now the audience sees a girl as something other, different, because we've now aligned ourselves with James Stewart, the male character. Kim Novak's character isn't overly sexualized in the scene. That's not what I'm talking about with the male gaze. It can be part of that, but it's when the camera, the character, and the audience are all assumed to align with a straight male viewpoint. This isn't vilifying that identity. This isn't saying straight men are awful. This is me just saying that that assumed viewpoint is so innate in how Hollywood codes its camera work and cinema and its just basic language of editing and everything that we now take it for granted and it just becomes part of the everyday way in which we associate the camera and how films are made. But with trans people, we sit in sort of an interesting intersection of this gaze. When a trans character looks in a mirror, because trans characters are sometimes protagonists of the film, they become become the holder of the gaze, the viewpoint of the audience, and yet they're also the thing that we're supposed to find fascinating, different, strange, or weird. And so that mirror becomes sort of this reflection and injunction point upon which a transgender person sort of transitions between viewer and someone with agency and someone without agency and the object. Now I've talked about this more in this video if you want to check it out. But the Matrix movies intentionally take this idea of the mirror and subvert this narrative and reclaim the mirror to codify trans cinematic symbols to reflect the larger film's themes. Think of how Neo in the Matrix movie is able to transition into a new life through the mirror, is able to navigate that world of not having agency, of being an object, into being someone with agency, into having actual agency within this new world outside of the Matrix to have a new body and a new name at the same time. Kind of relates to a transgender reading there. From this point, Neo is both visually reflected in mirrored surfaces and across genders with trinities, and narratively duplicated across a virtual, actual border between cinematic worlds. This doubling references the classic transsexual trope of the mirror scene, in which the dysphoric trans subject mournfully regards the obdurate surfaces of the mirror as it delivers an improperly gendered reflection. However, the Matrix evolves this motif. Rather than presenting a perceptual limit, the mirror will become sensorial transition, on the other side of which Neo will find yet another of his bodies waiting for him. As he sits anticipating the red pill's effects, Neo notices a mirror in which his reflection first appears shattered, referencing the amalgamated cut-up mode of transsexual aesthetic. In his next glance, the mirror has begun to liquefy and flow, held back only by what appears to be surface tension, a digital deconstruction or speculative transing of the object's boundness. We then awake with Neo in his machine pod, aware of his physical body for the first time. Rather than reproducing the traditional mirror scene's yearning melancholy for a real sex, the fluid mirror has internally multiplied Neo's proprioceptive positions so that he will be able to occupy and move between his linked bodies. Much like medical transition pluralizes the internalized image of the gendered sex self over recall time, the ingested mirror permanently folds Neo's consciousness back on itself, providing him with a reflexive mode of self-perception in which each of his body simultaneously senses the other. Now we'll come back to all those ideas in just a second, but I want to step back and just remind you that this is really important for the Matrix to have done. Because in a time where trans and many LGBTQ characters were and still are not able to exist in blockbuster films, a movie of this scale and size like The Matrix, where trans themes were so vital to it, finally gave trans people the chance to see representation, to see a movie that understood us. Even if it wasn't explicitly understanding us, it implicitly did. We felt like The Matrix gave voice to something that we could never actually explicitly state beforehand. Many trans people felt like Neo earlier in The Matrix, with his mouth covered over by the agents of The Matrix, making us unable to verbalize our pain. And so, if that was one reaction to The Matrix, we see that, too, reflected within Resurrections. If we go back to the character of Bug that I mentioned earlier, that character is seen viewing The Matrix at the beginning of Resurrections, and we see that she's coded as a non-binary type character. 
She's got the stereotypical androgynous look. She's got blue hair that every single trans person seems to get at some point, myself included, and just gives off those envy vibes that all of us feel. Like very stereotypical ones for sure, but definitely those vibes. Believe me, every single non-binary person I know saw a bug and was like, yeah, you're non-binary, or at least you, get, you got some gender non-conforming stuff going on there. But Bug also, like many trans viewers of the original Matrix, reflects upon how Neo was the first time that she was able to see herself. You will remember me, but a long time ago you changed my life. When you leapt off another roof, back then I was just like any other copper top, pretending my life, until I looked up and I saw you. It was a different you, but I saw the real you, just a second before you leapt. And you never fell. Like so many trans people who looked at Neo in the original Matrix trilogy, Bug finally was able to see herself through Neo fighting the system. She was able to come out to her true self through the representation that Neo provided. Like how the Matrix and the Wachowskis themselves inspired so many trans folks and meant so much to trans folks. You made it possible and it changed everything. But what's important here is not to just recognize that Bug and the original Matrix movies were somehow this big explosion for trans people. That was definitely there. But what's even more important is that the Matrix movies took the trans experience, this recognizing that we were in a system that confined us and defined us, even though we didn't have to be confined and defined that way, and took that idea and made it universal. It took a trans experience and made it a universal one. Because being trans is only one way in which I think so many of us recognize that we are living in a system that confines us and defines us, like capitalism. This is the thing that I think is most revolutionary about the original Matrix trilogy and even Resurrections. It takes a queer experience and a trans experience and makes it relatable to a mass audience. Mainstream media tends to see queer stories as something other, something different, something strange, rather than something that many people can relate to. But in actuality, I feel that the feeling of uncertainty and anxiety about identity is actually a much more ubiquitous feeling and experience that pretty much everyone feels, just more on the surface and palatable and easily understandable when described in a queer context. So the Matrix franchise does something truly special in that it doesn't code transness as other, but transness as both normal and a shared communal experience and trauma that we all currently have in our current capitalist society. It takes the feeling that trans people have and say that that feeling, while it's expressed in gender for trans people, is something that all of us feel in some way, shape, or form in how we relate to our current day society. I think the Matrix franchise honestly only, maybe failure is the wrong word, considering that the studios wouldn't have let them do this in the first place, but the place where the franchise is wanting is that it doesn't make this connection between trans and queer experiences to a universal sense of anxiety more literal and explicit, instead just leaving it metaphorical, even within Resurrections, which, while much more overt, is still coded in technological logical allegory, and therefore able to be denied by those looking for any excuse to do so. The Matrix took a very specific experience that trans people have and made it into something larger and a look at the larger systems that oppress us. And we see this in Resurrections with Bug. Because Bug, after that point, becomes a member of the resistance to the machines. She breaks out of the Matrix. After all, Neo was able to make her see the truth of the Matrix, and she joined a group of people inspired by Neo to fight back against the machines, just as many viewers of the Matrix were also inspired to push back against the system, not only as just trans people, but against capitalism, against these ideas that the Matrix was pushing against, even if they weren't trans. A lot of people out there like me who are a little bit obsessed with your life. While the film is invariably trans, it by no means is exclusive to or owned by trans people, but just takes our experience and ubiquitizes it and shows how our experiences are often reflective of a much larger feeling of anxiety towards capitalist systems that so many of us have. And if we also see Neo as a metaphorical trans woman, we can also see how he in Resurrections also represents a sort of detransitioner narrative. 
Today, we often think of detransitioners in a way that many detransition stories have been co-opted by TERFs or the alt-right groups to say that gender ideology is forcing people to undergo irreversible damages and surgeries. People who realize that later they're not transgender, but they got all these different changes and can't go back. Now, now, that does happen. There is a small subset of a small subset of trans people that do detransition, and it is hard and horrible, and we should be trying to stop that. But they make up only 2% of the trans population, which itself only makes up 1% of the world, if you listen to most studies about detransitioners. But there are a large number of trans people who, as several studies have found out, begun transition, but decided to detransition due to societal pressures, monetary issues, social stigmas against them, people in their family or society or community telling them that they are not actually trans, that they need to go back in the closet, them being told by therapists that they aren't actually trans, going through conversion therapy. Just like Neo is gaslit by his therapist, told to go back to sleep, to take his blue pills that will make him feel better. But Neo still knows that something isn't right. Something about this world feels wrong. Neo had a chance to recognize that he was a trans woman, that he came out and recognized the problems of the system, not just as a trans woman, but the entire world was wrong, but then went back. Went back into himself. Confined himself again. Because he was told that, oh, you're just crazy. You're not, you're not really that. Just as many trans people feel that, and just as many people who watch The Matrix and recognize, oh, capitalism is this horrible thing but didn't know what to do to fight it. Didn't know what to do to change that system. And so, ultimately, just went back right along into the system. Again, we see a trans experience made universal against this idea of the anxieties and feelings that we feel against capitalism. And this is all in the first 30 minutes of the movie, by the way. Resurrections analyzes and discusses how the legacy of the original film affects disparate people within it. But the film does much more than just reflect reaction, as it starts to analyze what we've done with that feeling since The Matrix came out. Let's talk about the end of the original Matrix trilogy. Many people said that Resurrections was a pointless film because the original trilogy definitively ended the story. But I never understood that reading. Because at the end of the Matrix Revolutions, the war wasn't over. Sure, Zion was saved and the machines retreat, but the world is still in control by the machines. Neo was only able to stop the attack on Zion because he allied with the machines to stop Agent Smith. And he did that. But the machines were still out there, and humans were still forced to live in their small underground orgy city. The system wasn't defeated. It still existed, the Matrix still went on. And so it was frustrating to see so many read revolutions as the ending, when it just was meant to be seen as a predictor of what was to come in real life. Again, let's continue to extend the capitalism metaphor out from the Matrix. If the machines represent the rich and powerful in control of the Matrix, aka the capitalist system, and the humans in the film represent all of us toiling away in the system for their benefit, what does Agent Smith? represent within all of this. In many ways, Agent Smith is both enforcer and a victim of the Matrix itself. We first meet him as a government agent, working to quash any resistance to the Matrix. As you can see, we've had our eye on you for some time now, Mr. Anderson. It seems that you've been living two lives. But eventually, in his dogmatic pursuit of Neo, he comes to realize how much he also suffers within the Matrix. You destroyed me, Mr. Anderson. Afterward, I knew the rules, I understood what I was supposed to do, but I didn't. Forced to do a job that he despises, even though within that job he holds power. He holds certain privileges. And so, when he is pushed back and defeated by Neo, and then ultimately forgotten by the machines in power who he was fighting for, he recognizes how he was just a tool of the system, even as he was afforded benefits within it. This zoo, this prison, this reality, whatever you want to call it, I can't stand it any longer. In many ways, he was a darker reflection of Neo. Then you're aware of it. Of what? Our connection. Thinking that he was the one, and certainly had the power to be, and yet not able to recognize who his actual enemy was, who was actually causing him to suffer. Let me remove the subtlety here. Agent Smith is a man radicalized to fascism. 
believing in his unique superiority because the system told him that he was superior. Human beings define their reality through misery and suffering. So the perfect world is a dream that your primitive cerebrum kept trying to wake up from. But then became angry at the system that once benefited him because it viewed him as replaceable because, well, he wasn't one of the rich machines. He was only a program made to enforce the system's will. When we think of fascism in the United States, we often think it's tied to white supremacy, and with good reason. We see many working class young white men pushed into fascism because they understand on some level the harm that they suffer under capitalism, how they've been used and discarded for agendas for those in power, but also recognize that they had some privilege beforehand, that their skin color and gender allowed them to take benefits from the system that was made to help them but not recognizing that class will always outstrip this. That even though they were granted certain privileges under the system, that because they weren't rich and powerful, they were never going to win the game. But instead of recognizing that, instead of realizing that the system isn't really working for them, they see those trying to fight for the same equality and footing that they have and for all of us to have. Marginalized folks, they see them as the enemy because they see them as the most immediate threats to their current status instead of allies in the same fight against the same people harming us all. These privileged folks might be analogous to the programs living within the Matrix, who are able to have high paying jobs or getting to run the new Matrix as we later learn the analyst is in Resurrections. Programs are people who have more power than humans within this system, but still aren't considered as worthwhile as the rich and powerful machines in charge of the entire system, or the suits, as the analyst refers to them as in Resurrections. The suits tried, obviously without control of your source code, I knew that was impossible. Agent Smith, however, is somewhat slightly different, because when we first meet him, he is actually an enforcer of the system, of the state. He actually has slightly more power to enforce and enact violence within the Matrix. While he's coded as an FBI agent, a direct agent of the system, he also takes over the role of police officer throughout the film too. In real life, police are often tools in enforcing state power, not there to protect citizens, but to protect property and capital, to protect the system, like Agent Smith is for the Matrix. There is also, as we have started to become more aware in popular consciousness over the past few years and decades, a huge issue with white-leaning bias and even outright white supremacist teachings in policing. How police are often told to over-police black communities are often more likely to react with violence when they encounter black people and more. Yet, while police are often in hold of power and privilege over others, they often come from lower class communities, and are often seen as just as disposable by those in power, even those who would use them to enact their power. Sitting at this crux of privilege, power, and disenfranchisement under the system, it's not surprising then that we see numerous studies that show police officers are disproportionately more likely to join alt-right, fascist, or white supremacist organizations. Again, similar to how Agent Smith slowly morphs into a metaphor for a growing fascist movement within The Matrix Reloaded and Revolutions. So those who fall into fascist movements are often both, again, victim and enforcer, and a danger to both. Agent Smith was wielded by the system, but his growing wage and his ability to radicalize others to his cause quickly to make them just like him presented a growing threat. So when Neo teams up with the machines at the end to defeat Agent Smith, it is an alliance to stop the growing threat of fascism because capitalism will always lead to fascism, privileging some over others and pitting them against everyone else, but ultimately needing to divest itself of its tools lest it challenge their power and take over. So at the end of the day, while Neo beat Agent Smith, Neo died, but capitalism machines still went on. So basically what I'm saying is think of the victory at the end of the Matrix Revolutions as basically just getting Joe Biden elected. For many more radical leftist movements, Joe Biden represented a return to near-liberal pre-Trump era politics, a man who many were forced to vote for as a form of harm reduction, seeing the alternative of Trump and his more totalitarian inclinations in stoking a fascistic rhetoric and movements as much more harmful. However, Biden represents for many the exact same policies and issues with neoliberal capitalistic government that existed in the United States before Trump that led to the rising tide of fascism that Trump represented in the first place, a call for a return to normalcy that in actuality just reset the clock back only a few years, restarting the cycle again rather than ending it, but now on a much faster timetable as we're soon to probably see this year with the midterm elections. While the growing issue of rising fascist movements and the return possibly of Trump in 2024 still being very much on the table and very much a present issue even though many people wish to ignore it, to go back to sleep, to say that it's not there, that we dealt with it. 
when we very much did not. We stalled the rising tide of fascism right before they had their coup, but the main problem still exists. And Biden, I mean the machines, aren't really doing much to change the system. In fact, many ways are perpetuating it and causing it to happen all over again. The same cycle happening all over again. And this constant political loop, this Ouroboros that eats its own tail, is reflected within the Matrix itself in numerous ways. First and foremost, The Matrix Resurrections itself is a kind of re-loop of the entire first trilogy, kind of retelling the same story of that first trilogy, doing the same thing again. But even within this new version of The Matrix, Neo is forced to redo the same day over and over and over again, as we see in the montage when he is forced to remake The Matrix games. Even further, we learn at the beginning of Resurrections that the scene that we play out from the original Matrix movies actually takes place inside what is called a modal, a small program meant to play out the same loops over and over and over again. You're thinking this modal is a loop or treadmill? Even further, when Neo leaves the Matrix, we see that the fight against the system is still ongoing and the same beats are repeating themselves just with a new team of people. The loops constantly refrain over and over and over again. The faces may change like new versions of Morpheus and Agent Smith, but the dynamics are exactly the same. So too with capitalist systems with the same beats over and over and over again. The politicians, the faces may change, but the dynamics stay exactly the same. Not to mention that we also all ourselves feel like we are caught in loops, doing the same day over and over and over and over again, going to our same jobs over and over and over and over and over again, just as Neo is in Resurrections. Constant feedback loops are part of capitalist structures, both in a microcosm and a macrocosm, limiting what our lives and our outlook on the future can be to just being stuck in these same ideas over and over and over again, never creating anything new, just regurgitating the same thing. Something that we're going to be talking about in just a second. And Resurrections recognizes this. The Matrix still exists in this world, but how can it? Given that most people had come to recognize how dangerous this system was when Agent Smith nearly destroyed the first one, how can we uphold a new Matrix, uphold that same system, if it was nearly destroyed by a coup at the end? Well, we're given the first hints of this in the film's dissection of nostalgia. In the world that feels so uncertain, nostalgia, looking towards a past that we know existed, makes us feel better. Resurrections is a film about nostalgia. How nostalgia, looking to the past, gives us a sense of certainty. And we see this in our popular culture. We see this in cinema itself. I mean, the week before Resurrections came out, Spider-Man No Way Home became one of the top grossing movies of all time. It was a film literally about bringing together different heroes and villains from across numerous different film franchises, and itself set within a 30 film franchise, making us remember all the good times we had with all of those characters. And don't get me wrong, I loved No Way Home, don't get me wrong, I love to see my boy Tommy McGuire again. He was beautiful and I loved him. But the film, built itself on reflecting on the past and our feelings about it. If you hadn't known Tobey Maguire or Andrew Garfield as Spider-Man before that movie, would their inclusion in No Way Home hit as hard? Would Andrew Garfield saving MJ carry weight in that movie if we didn't remember his past saving Gwen Stacy? And No Way Home, by the way, is a singular example, but we currently live in a media landscape dominated by reboots, films that rely on intertextual understandings of other films, remakes, and continuations of numerous different franchises. Nostalgia permeates our media landscape, and it does so because many of us wish to escape into our past into nostalgia because the now feels so damn scary and uncertain. And our media feeds it to us because they want the money. Capitalism creates the uncertainty and then monetizes the only way that we have to be able to feel better about that uncertainty by feeding us nostalgia for the past. Yet these appeals to the past of cinema also take on a darker aspect too. You see, nostalgia only reflects the past, but it's also a fleeting, calorieless meal. But these current versions of these things often leave many people feeling dissatisfied, like they aren't as good as what we remembered about the past, that the thing that we're eating now isn't as good as what we had. Think about how there are elements of numerous fan bases of Star Wars or He-Man or Cowboy Bebop or Star Trek. They constantly argue that the current iterations of the franchise aren't as good as the past works. Now, I'm not saying they're right or wrong. It's different with every case. But what's most important is how that nostalgia has been used to stoke strong emotions, often anger, often feeling that people want to go back to the past. 
that Star Wars as we knew it, Star Wars as a property that George Lucas created is no more. It just does not exist from that perspective. It only exists to be a social justice propaganda machine. And the anger could then be turned to political motivations. People blaming things that they see as different in these new versions of these things that are being made as the reasons for them being not as good. That they have different minorities represented in the cast. That they have different people behind the helm. And there were different political ideologies driving these different remakes. It's been pretty clear that it's going to be bogged down by what almost everything that gets popular gets bogged down by. Identity, politics, and SJW nonsense. Because this is what they do. If something is popular, if something has a platform, they want to interject that into whatever it is that has the platform. We've seen this over and over again from movies. We've seen it in certain games. And so these things that they see as different within these nostalgia bait films are seen as the reasons for them not being as good and therefore get vilified in a larger context. And now this pop culture anxiety that has now been politicized against certain political ideologies is then taken advantage of and wielded by far right and fascistic movements. Take for example how Steve Bannon and Breitbart gained popularity and power after the Gamergate movement, which is chronicled quite well in this excellent video by Innuendo Studios that I highly recommend. Or still to this day where we see folks like Alex Jones appearing on anti-SJW pop culture channels right here on YouTube. Whoa, yeah, love to see you, man. Oh, shit. We love Welcome, it, Alex. Alex. You guys are in a lot of trouble. Yes, yeah. I, I, I want to get in a lot of trouble. We, we would expect nothing more. We would expect nothing more. Alex. Well, that's, hello uh, so Jones. far has been fine. I mean, why in heaven's name is Alex Jones appearing on a bunch of pop culture anti-SJW YouTubers channels? Because he is well aware that this anger at pop culture and vitriol at pop culture that has been politicized can be co-opted and wielded to turn people into right-wing and fascistic ideologies and movements. Hollywood is a negative, like trash mm. you've got to pay to get rid of. And so it's lashing out with a great reset to collapse us and gaslight us and turn us all around. So as soon as their image machine and as soon as they being in love with themselves finally died, it was dangerous because that was their identity. Now they went, well, screw it. We have these battle plans to deindustrialize or release a bioweapon and start killing everybody. We never really went along with this, but actually, since they don't love us anymore, and since we can't mesmerize them, let's just wreck everything and bring them down with us. Mm -hmm. That's it. <laughs> I found this live stream that I'm showing you specific clips of to be entirely illuminating, not just because of Alex Jones's presence, but because of what some of the YouTubers were saying is, is the reason that they felt pushed out by current pop culture. Oh, they're just full of self-loathing and they want to drag you down with them. That's exactly how it feels with today's entertainment. You feel, you feel the utter disdain when you go and watch a show. You know, we used to go to shows for entertainment, for escapism, to get away from everyday life. You know, we all work hard. We, we want to uh, just relax at the end of the day. But yeah, we give me a fantasy, but make it good. Not yeah, exactly. It yeah, give us something to invest in. Just give us something to, to take us away for a bit. But we now go to our entertainment and we just have this, this finger wagging. You're a bunch of horrible, disgusting, <laughs> vile human beings. You need to change if you're not. It's just like, fuck you. I don't need this. I don't yeah. need this. Let me tell you want to fucking relax. You guys rip off there's this. so much bad stuff happening in the world. Isn't it just so telling that exact quote from anti-SJW YouTuber Heels Babyface? How he literally states that quote, he was working hard all day and he connects his anxiety and tiredness working all day to then his desire to have his nostalgia, to relax, to watch entertainment with just a shallow mindset, to not actually critically engage to it, to be lulled to sleep at the end of a day working because he's tired. He wants to take his blue pill, even if he doesn't recognize it that way. But then he goes on to say he feels today that he, as a white straight man, is looked down upon by modern media. He blames the growing representation of minorities in fiction as somehow oppressing him, saying he's worthless, saying how other people getting to be represented is somehow a reflection on his worth as a human being, which it's not. How because Star Wars doesn't center a white dude anymore, that this is somehow saying he's a bad guy. It's a sense in anger and frustration at minorities that is reflected in someone like Agent Smith. How he feels a sense of self-loathing that he blames the humans for. I can't stand it any longer. It's the smell. If there is such a thing, I feel saturated by it. Agent Smith is a deeply self-loathing man, especially in the first Matrix movie. 
Yet he doesn't realize that it's not humans who have forced him into the state, but the system himself. So when Neo, quote, frees him, instead of lashing out against the system of the Matrix first, he lashes out at Neo. But he also starts to recognize the connection he has with Neo because they actually are fighting the same fight, but lashing out in different ways. Because as Agent Smith gets further radicalized towards fascism, he begins to realize the connection he has with Neo, both reflections of each other, both suffering, yet lashing out in different ways because he's been fed a different narrative, one that actually supports the system overall and is part of what the system wants. Just as these YouTubers feel too, the narrative fed to them by folks like Alex Jones. And by the way, just to be clear, I'm just speaking about the greater feeling of anxiety underlying so many of these anti-SJW YouTubers, and not specifically calling any of them out. But I'm not here to talk about specific YouTubers, only the dynamics that play in their views and rhetoric and the underlying feelings underneath them that The Matrix Resurrections is getting at. That all these folks are feeling this anxiety at capitalism, yet have been tricked into blaming the wrong people based out of their anxiety. And meanwhile, while this division between groups is stoked, the system in charge benefits. While Neo and Agent Smith fight each other, the machines continue to use human beings as batteries, and, as we saw in Resurrections, continued its fight to destroy humanity even after Neo saved Zion at the end of Revolutions. And so too do we see this stoking of division for corporate benefit in the real world, as well as using it to make corporations' own harm invisible in its own systemic abuses. Want a good example of this that's relevant to the Matrix Resurrections? Well, in the start of the movie, we see a Game Awards statue awarded to Neo for his work being a good video game programmer. Coincidentally enough, this year at the 2021 Game Awards, there was a segment early in the ceremony where the Game Awards producer Jeff Keighley called out toxic harassment in gaming culture. So let me just say this before we get to any of the news or announcements or awards. We should not and will not tolerate any abuse, harassment, and predatory practices by anyone, including our online communities. As we know from Gamergate, again, check out that wonderful NUNU Studios video, this harassment of minorities in gaming culture is stoked by an industry that mainly appealed to white privileged men, especially as it started to grow as an industry. But as women, trans folks, people of color, and other minorities have grown in presence, representation, and being able to be both behind and in front of the gaming screen, have been listened to in the gaming industry and games journalism, harassment has increased as the anxiety the gamers who used to be centered and privileged in the space feel threatened. The same dynamic of anxiety that we've been talking about with agents Smith, as well as other anti-SJW YouTuber channels that I've been talking about elsewhere. So to call out harassment in gaming culture is a good thing. And then, as if conscious of this exact fact, the next segment in the Game Awards after this moment was a bit about drag queens in gaming, representing elements of LGBTQ culture that rarely get shown in the gaming world in a spotlight like this. Which is great! Hooray! Calling out toxic gamers and showing representation. Good on the Game Awards. I appreciate it. Yet, immediately after this, they showed this trailer for the new Star Wars game, Star Wars Eclipse. You see, Star Wars Eclipse is a game being made by a studio called Quantic Dream, whose founder, David Cage, is currently embroiled in a lawsuit for issues of harassment of women and LGBTQ folks at his company, including sending Nazi imagery around as jokes within the company. Even further, it came out in the investigation that David Cage has allegedly publicly stated sentences like, quote, in my games, all women are whores and, quote, at Quantic Dream, we do not make games for f**ks. So yeah, that's the company making Star Wars Eclipse. So right after a segment calling out harassment and showing LGBTQ culture, the Game Awards platformed a game made by someone who has directly done harassment and attacked LGBTQ folks, which just seems entirely contradictory to what they were trying to do. But the Game Awards did this because they had a big money deal probably with Disney and Quantic Dreams to show the game, following the money, not actually doing the work to change gaming culture within the systems of harassment that we constantly see in corporate culture at companies like Activision Blizzard, Ubisoft, and Quantic Dream, but just dealing with harassment within the player sphere, not actually addressing the issues on a corporate level. And this isn't me calling out any one person like Jeff Keighley, who I know is a guy trying his best to do what's good for others. But this one specific incident among many across all industries highlights how capitalism makes invisible its own systems of harm while stoking binarized antagonistic infighting in those it takes advantage of. How despite individuals' good intentions, the system itself will always reinforce itself and its own power. 
highlighting the infighting between gamers, between those suffering under the system, whether that they be harasser or harassee, while corporations and those in charge of them who do deep systemic harm and feed on this very dynamic will continue to make money and get away scot-free. Such as how despite a huge lawsuit detailing harassment culture within Activision Blizzard, which was perpetuated and enabled by its CEO Bobby Kotick, Activision Blizzard was just bought by Microsoft for nearly $70 billion, and Kotick will be able to leave the company with a huge payday. And certainly while I think Microsoft will be a better corporate structure than Activision Blizzard ever was for the employees working there, it's still sad that all these people just get to make money while the issues of harassment were never directly addressed by the people who enabled it. In fact, quite the opposite, Bobby Kotick and many at Activision Blizzard tried to downplay the harassment charges and attack those who tried to speak about it in their own company. Not to mention, these large gaming companies tried out the latest scam to make money in gaming like NFTs or loot boxes or addictive gaming loops, forcing gamers to play worse games that cost us more. This also isn't even to mention that Disney, which owns the Star Wars franchise, constantly performatively placing LGBTQ characters in the backgrounds of scenes like they did in Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker, or how they constantly have their first gay character ever in an easily cut and missable sequence in all of their movies, proving this exact dynamic of not actually addressing issues relevant to people, but just trying to perform them. And then this exact dynamic being politicized by right-wing groups in order to attack these exact representations as the problem when it's actually the corporations that are actually failing to create meaningful works of art. The answer isn't cutting out these representations in film, but to actually do them authentically and more integrally to the story and plot, and sometimes as the center of the story, and to actually make stories that are relevant to what people are feeling. Yet all of this is made invisible, and instead infighting is stoked between people, and a sense of nostalgia is constantly fed to people in order to make them feel like the past was greater was better, so work to recreate the past. But people don't recognize that that shallow nostalgia feeling has nothing to do with representation, but has everything to do with the lack of desires to studios to actually give voice to real issues. They just give us the shallow recreations and don't actually speak to anything that we're actually feeling. That's why they're not as good, not representation. And Resurrections is directly confronting that by directly feeding us nostalgic scenes from past movies of The Matrix, and it plays on that dynamic. We thought elements from your past might help ease you into the present. Nothing comforts anxiety like a little nostalgia. Yet it also asks us to interrogate why those original images were so powerful in the first place. What those original scenes meant in their original context to the people who were actually watching them like Bug, even if we are just watching a shallow recreation of them right now. I know you because I know the only thing that still matters to you. I know it's why you're here, why you're still fighting, and why you will never give up. Again, that distanciation were made to recognize that we're viewers of the film in the larger context, because again, The Matrix was about something more than just a cool action movie. But when studios try to make nostalgia make movies like Resurrections to just try to recapture the past, it's almost attempting to trivialize the original works to make money. Think of how like how Marvel movies are just there to sell Marvel toys, or how Harry Potter constantly sells Hogwarts merch, how the Matrix movies, which are about fighting a capitalist systems, have been sold over and over and over again. Toys and different merch has all been made for the Matrix. Something powerful and meaningful has been made trivial, taken by the system it railed against, and made meaningless. They took your story, something that meant so much to people like me, and turned it into something trivial. <laughs> it's what the Matrix does. It weaponizes every idea, every dream, everything that's important to us. This is what capitalism does, takes resistance against it, takes works of art against it, and makes it part of itself. It makes you start to believe that consuming something that speaks about resistance is just as good as resisting. And all the while, they're benefiting from your resistance. Take a look at something like Squid Games, a deeply anti-capitalist work of art that came out in 2021, and how it became Netflix's top streaming show. It obviously spoke to anxieties that all of us were feeling, but now it's getting a needless season two that doesn't need to be a second season of Squid Games, and yet it's going to get a season two, a season three, a season four. Think of all the Squid Games Halloween costumes that people bought, made trivial and meaningless and just a thing to play act at, as opposed to actually doing work to recognize what Squid Games was actually saying. 
By the way, if you don't believe or want a greater analysis of why Squid Games represents an anti-capitalist narrative, I highly recommend this video by Kay and Skittles that analyzes how Squid Game breaks down the ideology of capitalism and specifically how capitalism has appeared in South Korea. It's a truly excellent video that I cannot recommend enough. And if you want more information about how a vague sense of anti-capitalism without being actually linked to a demonstrable desire for change or actual solutions can be used to propagate capitalism itself, as well as create a sense of nihilism about our ability to actually change the system, check out this wonderful video by St. Andrewism. And so too this happened with The Matrix. It was made trivial. And Resurrections comments upon this. We wanted The Matrix movies to be this big power fantasy of us taking over the system. But like Neo, we learned that we couldn't do much. So we just went back to consuming. Just consuming pale echoes of things we used to love because of how uncertain we feel. We rewatch The Matrix because it feels good. It feels like we're pushing back against the system. But ultimately we're not. Even further, it's important to note that The Matrix is a movie made by trans people. Trans people rarely get to make movies of this scale. And when marginalized communities create elements of culture as a form of resistance and create a sense of communal identity, capitalism often eventually steals these things to make more money. Think of how parts of LGBTQ culture like drag have been taken to be made more ubiquitous and consumable by the wider society. Drag and ballroom culture has its origins in the mid 1900s as a countercultural movement by LGBTQ and communities of color, done only at night in what were seen as disreputable LGBTQ areas like San Francisco's Tenderloin District. But drag has now been capitalized and monetized to be basically mainstream taken away from its countercultural roots to then be actually used to prop up capitalistic aims and goals to make people like RuPaul money. Just like how the analyst, Neil Patrick Harris's character, who we come to later learn is in control of this version of the Matrix and Resurrections, uses Neo's main power, bullet time, against him, so too does capitalism utilize the tools and ideas of those who fight against it and make it part of itself. Allow me to sum up our goal in a single word. Bullet time. I know. Kinda ironic. Using the power that defined you to control you. <laughs> but let's go back to the analyst and that uncertainty that capitalism creates. We find that Neo's therapist is the analyst, the creator of the new Matrix. Unlike the original Matrix, which was created by the architect who only saw a number of spreadsheets and how much energy was being input and output at any given time without understanding the actual humanity behind it, the analyst actually understands human emotions. You ever wonder why you have nightmares? Why your own brain tortures you? It's actually us maximizing your output. It works just like this. Oh no, can you stop the bullet if only you could move faster? <laughs> Here's the thing about feelings. They're so much easier to control than facts. The analyst realizes that by creating that sense of anxiety, of uncertainty, he can push into motion the matrix system in the way that we just described. By increasing uncertainty, he can increase productivity, can increase consumption, because we want to hold on to what we have, but also we want to keep pushing to create the past. A past where the matrix already existed. The worse we treat you, the more we manipulate you, the more energy you produce. It's nuts. I've been setting productivity records every year since I took over. And the best part, zero resistance. People stay in their pots, happier than pigs in shit. Taking an extreme example to highlight the issue, take how during the pandemic, productivity rates at most companies went up. How when most of us were faced with the greatest amount of anxiety in our lives caused by COVID, our workload and workload getting done increased. Not only that, think about how once this was happening, purchasing rates increased as well. How things like Amazon's profit margins deeply increased. How while it faced an initial dip, the stock market continued to grow to new heights during the pandemic. And how today so many people are feeling intense burnout because of all of this. But while the pandemic is mildly unique, it only highlighted the issues within the system, pushing them to extremes making it more obvious to notice, but not actually being something different but just reflective of what the system was already doing before the pandemic. The analyst creates this entire system that I just described, this feeling for nostalgia and wanting to work for the past, but also just recreating the past instead of actually recreating and fighting the system. We're just making versions of the past and fighting each other instead of actually creating something new and instead of actually creating a new system or thinking of a new way about the world. It's honestly just kind of brilliant if you think about it. Why do you think the analyst cat's name is literally deja vu? Besides, you know, just a clever call back to the Matrix 1. Oh, deja vu. 
Speaking of deja vu though, it's by no means a coincidence that in the Matrix movies it's a sign that there are agents of the Matrix nearby when you start to see things doing repeating loops. What is it? Deja vu is usually a glitch in the Matrix. Quite literally, when agents of capitalism are near you in the Matrix, things start to loop back in on themselves. And these ideas aren't just made in our pop culture. Think of refrains like make America great again, an appeal to the past. Instead of creating a new future, instead of saying let's make America greater, let's make America better, it's let's make America great again. Going back to saying it was better in the past, let's go back to that, back when the system was still there. But many people bought into that idea because it appealed to this need for certainty in uncertain times. We knew we existed in the past, and wasn't that past good for some? So why not go back to it? And for anyone who recognizes that, hey, the past wasn't good for everyone, the people in power who are trying to make us want to go for the past say, hey, they're the ones that are actually the problem. They don't want you to go back to that past. They're the ones that are making things uncertain. Fight them. Fight the minorities, not us in power. We just want to give you certainty. We just want to give you your pills. Never mind that we're just trying to recreate a past that already kept us in power taking advantage of you. And these pills start to create a new reality. One where feelings, our feelings about reality, matter more than what actually the facts of reality are. Something the analyst directly states. But he never bothered to realize that you don't give a shit about facts. It's all about fiction. The only world that matters is the one in here. And you people believe the craziest shit. Why? What validates and makes your fictions real? feelings. The direct link between a longing for the past and the anxiety the current state of the world of the analyst creates allows him to directly influence how people view and see reality. He can morph their feelings to create a new way to see the world. And isn't this what we see today? Groups of people being told by politicians like Donald Trump to have a nostalgic view of the past, to feel the anxiety of the present, and blame minorities and anyone who opposes him as the reason for that, and to plant a new version of reality. Create a big lie. For example, that the election was stolen from Trump, despite all the evidence to the contrary, because it feeds into the feeling that people wish to feel. And because of that, the lie stops being a political thing to them, it becomes part of their identity, a part of who they are. That's the mistakes that so many of us, I think, make when we try to argue against this rhetoric. We aren't arguing against a political ideology when we fight these alternative realities. We're fighting something that has been made intrinsically tied to someone's identity. It's because they need it in order to not feel the anxiety or fear of the world that capitalism has intentionally created for them. They're drinking their blue pills because it's the only way that they feel comfortable. And the analyst and people in power turn that anxiety into hatred and anger at people like Neo. As we see later in the film, where Matrix citizens literally upon the hundreds sacrifice themselves to kill Neo for the analyst. We see this today too, with, for example, a study finding that a majority of conservative voters see left-leaning citizens as a serious threat to the nation, when really, we're both all on the same side. But we've been pitted against each other in a binary fight caused by this dynamic similar to what the analyst sets up. And the ones who suffer are just us, and not those in power, causing the problem, like the analyst. Look no further than the January 6th Capitol riot for a perfect example of this. I'm not saying the people that participated in that riot were innocent, far from it. But they were not the ones who incited the riot. In fact, they were told that the election was stolen. They were sold a version of reality that told them that they needed to do this. That they were doing the right thing, trying to defend their country. They have been given a lie fed by their nostalgia for the past that has become core to their identity. And they are the ones being charged, arrested, blamed, vilified, and torn from their families. Again, not without reason, but I do have sympathy because they were told this. They, this reality forces them to do this because that's what they believe they need to do to save the world. The ones that I don't have sympathy for, the ones that created that reality, the ones that sold these people that blue pill, they're the ones that get away scot-free. In fact, they're more popular now, more likely to gain power in just a few years, all based on this lie, this reality. And the more you reinforce this reality, feed it into people's feelings with conspiracy theories that justify people's feelings, not what's actually going on, then you reaffirm your own power. And all of this is exactly what Resurrections displays. It's a nostalgia bait film that interrogates how nostalgia bait films and nostalgia works, and how it's used to reaffirm a system rather than fighting against it.
Okay, so before you judge this outfit, just know that I got these Matrix tights and this Matrix bra for Christmas, and they're the most comfortable things I own. I even have Matrix underwear on right now, and it's incredibly comfortable, and I just kind of wanted to show it off for this video, so you're just gonna have to deal with it for the rest of this video. I'm gonna be wearing this. It's comfy, enjoy it. It's on theme at least. But anyways, back to Resurrections. Is Resurrections actually that cynical? That we can create anti-capitalist works of art, but ultimately it's just going to reaffirm the system. Doesn't feel like it changed anything. The Matrix is the same or worse. And I'm back where I started. It feels like everything I did, everything we did, None of it mattered. No, no it's not. Because we see in Resurrections that Neo's work from the original Matrix trilogy did make a difference. All of it mattered. I can show you. Once Neo escapes the Analyst Matrix, we learn that his story did change things. He didn't defeat the machines, but he inspired others to join the fight. More machines now fight with humanity. The fight goes on, sure, but he made a difference. So too did the Matrix movies. They may not have destroyed the entire capitalist system like it tried to inspire us to do, but it did make a difference. It did inspire people like Bug, like trans people, to come out, and others to join together and recognize the message that the film was trying to convey, to find and fight the system, but more importantly, what Resurrection shows is that we found community. And this is the aspect that I always love about the Wachowskis and specifically Lana's work. In a world that prizes and praises individualism, that we all must work alone and strive hard and just labor with our own bodies, where we have individual hero protagonists in all the blockbuster movies that celebrate the big hero, the Wachowskis' work is almost always an ensemble. We see community working together in almost all of the works, for example, like in Sense8, who, by the way, most of the cast of Sense8 appear in Matrix Resurrections, and it makes me so happy to see them again. I just like seeing my little Sense8 fam. It just makes me so happy. The Matrix, the system, tries to tell us that we're the heroes of our own story, that we're powerful individuals. But it's individualism that separates us, tells us not to find common community and understanding and goals. To escape that system, you have to find a community of people just as powerful as you that it's the connection that pulls us together and gives us power. And it's that connection that drives the entire plot of Resurrections. Neo recognizes that he doesn't have the same power and strength that he used to as the One. He's been defanged, as it were, but he's still got something in there, just as Resurrection does. It's not the Matrix, but it's still pushing forward. It's still got a little something to say and to do. Many people complained about the film's action, and yeah, for sure, Resurrection's action sucked, like a lot especially compared to the original Matrix movies. It's honestly deeply disappointing, especially when you consider that Keanu Reeves can still kick ass. I mean, look at the John Wick movies. Like, fucking A, I get so excited every time I turn one of those movies on. So why didn't Resurrections utilize Keanu Reeves' clear skill? Well, it's because that's kind of the point, right? Resurrections isn't the Matrix 1. It's not going to change the world in the same way, and neither can Neo do the same thing that he once did. He can't fly. But what he can do is fight for connection. Fight for the love of his life, Trinity, who is stuck in the Matrix. The whole main plot drive of this movie is Neo trying to fight back to get to Trinity, to rescue her from the Matrix that controlled him, to find that connection because it's that connection that there is power. The Analyst realized that. He realized that by keeping Neo and Trinity near each other, he can leech their power. But he keeps them just enough apart in order for them to yearn for each other, to try to strive for each other, to strive for that connection without actually having it. Alone, neither of you is of any particular value. Like acids and bases, you're dangerous when mixed together. Every sim where you two bonded, let's just say bad things happened. As long as I manage to keep you close, but not too close, I discovered something incredible. For example, he literally makes Neo yearn for Trinity by literally having her be with a Chad. What's going on? We're gonna be late. This is my husband, Chad. Nice to meet you. Hey. 
Like, way to be a beta male, my Neo man. Neo is apparently a soy boy to the analyst. Which is funny, considering that many transphobes call trans women soy boys, and considering that Neo is a metaphorical trans woman, yeah, you can see the connection there. Also, even further, this Chad is literally played by Chad Stelhesky, and he was Keanu Reeves' stunt double in the Matrix franchise. So Trinity literally married a Chad who doubled for Neo. Honestly, it's moments like this that I think that we are living in a literal Matrix because that is just just too perfect. Yeah, he wasn't just Keanu's stunt double, he was also the director of the John Wick movies and a stunt coordinator. So, Lana Wachowski literally had the man on set who taught Keanu Reeves his badass John Wickness. So it's not like Resurrections couldn't have had better action, the dude was literally right there on set who could have made it happen. But this speaks to and reinforces how disinterested Resurrections is in showing a powered up badass Neo, because the entire point is focusing on how he isn't a badass fighter or the one anymore. You're not what you used to be. It's true. But the analysts realized that if he ever brought them together, if he ever let them get together, they would ultimately destroy the Matrix because coming together is how we defeat systems like this. So in the film's third act, Neo reaches out to Trinity and reminds them of their love. And it works eventually. Trinity can take the red pill again and recognize that she too has been lulled back to sleep, but awakens with the community working together to pull her out to make her wake up, to recognize who she is, her true self. By the way, I should say, I've mainly ignored analysis of the character of Trinity within Resurrections throughout this video, and how wonderfully she and her storyline maps onto a reading of a trans character coming into her own later in life. But I only did so because the wonderful YouTuber Renegade Cut did a fantastic video on her character already, so I'm just going to point you to his great video to check out if you want a good discussion and analysis of Trinity. And here the analyst uses all of his tools to fight to keep the Matrix. He uses swarm mode, literally bots. I mean, the analyst literally uses bots to swarm and attack Trinity and Neo. Come on. Bots have been used by many political groups online, but many in conservative and alt-right movements have used bots to great effect to pursue their movements. Also, the film ends with Trinity and Neo fighting literal attack helicopters. Neo and Trinity are fighting attack helicopters. Two transcoded characters are destroying attack helicopters. They're literally destroying the one joke. Oh, I identify as an attack helicopter. But going back a little bit, the analyst almost does succeed in beating Neo and Trinity in that moment, if not for two things. The first is that Agent Smith, sadly not played by Hugo Weaving in this movie, joins their side. Instead of the machines and humans teaming up to defeat fascism like they did at the end of Revolutions, Agent Smith, for one brief moment, is angrier at the system than at Neo and helps him. It's a dangerous alliance, though, because Agent Smith is just as willing to hurt Neo as he is anyone else. Here our unexpected alliance ends. You know the difference between us, Tom? Anyone could have been you. Or as I've always been anyone. Agent Smith in this version of The Matrix is actually the CEO of the gaming company that Neo works for. Agent Smith in this version of The Matrix holds power as the CEO. Again, he holds that sense of privilege that we talked about before, and he holds that sense of power over others. But he realizes here that Neo's labor as his creative partner is what holds him in that position. Without Neo, he wouldn't have anything. So if he wishes to fight the system, he needs to help Neo this time. But again, we all know that given the next opportunity, he might be just as willing to attempt to reassert his dominance and power over those he has control over at the top of the hill, rather than create a more equal society. Again, a dangerous alliance. Another thing that we could also talk about with both Agent Smith and the Catalyst both is the fact that in Resurrections, these characters are both played by prominent gay actors, Jonathan Groff and Neil Patrick Harris. And this casting feels completely intentional, especially in the light that some folks also read Agent Smith in the original Matrix trilogy as possibly akin to a closeted Catholic pastor, unable to express and actively ignoring or suppressing his own identity to the point of wishing to stamp it out in others like Neo, who again is coded as a LGBTQ character. 
But today, gay men have started to gain more acceptance in our society and have become less marginalized. So many gay white men of higher class, economic means, and privilege are more likely to hold on to their roles of privilege and push back against movements of other marginalized groups, aligning themselves more with their privileged identities rather than their marginalized one. It's a common dynamic we often see with folks who don't often have intersectional marginal identities, like we see with upper class white women with things like the TERF movement with those like JK Rowling, or alt-right gay men like Milo Yiannopoulos. But it's important to note that both Agent Smith and the Catalyst are not the leaders of the machines. They are still middlemen within both of these organizations. Agent Smith as the CEO who answers to Warner Brothers and the analyst who answers to the suits as he constantly refrains. The suits tried, obviously without control of your source code, I knew that was impossible. Just as many gay upper class white men will still be marginalized even though they associate more with their privileged identity than their singular marginalized one. But more importantly, the other reason that they win is that the analyst is defeated because Trinity learns to fly. Neo's power wasn't his own. What we learn in Resurrections is that it's not the one, but anyone can be the one. Anyone can fly. You just need to recognize it. This also brings us back to that idea of the male gaze that we discussed earlier. The male gaze often celebrates individualism, a singular protagonist and viewpoint. Most people believe that a male gaze is opposite, a feminine gaze if you will, is just having male characters be objectified and ogled by the camera in the same way women have been under the male gaze. But in reality, a feminine gaze, or more aptly a communal gaze, is something quite different. It's where multiple characters, multiple viewpoints are reflected in the narrative. Where we're not just seeing one objectifier, one protagonist, and everyone else in the narrative is seen as an other, as object, but that the viewpoint through which the audience is meant to identify changes throughout a work or series of works. Just as we see in the Wachowski's communal works like Sense8, which is a TV series literally about multiple protagonists sharing each other's points of view and experiences, hence why it's one of my favorite series of all time. This is also, by the way, why two of my favorite superhero movies of the past few years have been Harley Quinn's Birds of Prey and The Eternals, because they had a more communal gaze in the more typically individualist-focused superhero genre. And it's similarly too how the protagonist role, the role of The One, which was seemingly an individual role held by Neo in the original trilogy of The Matrix, is now shared between multiple people, passed off from Neo to Trinity within this film's narrative. This also reflects how the Wachowskis originally envisioned the Matrix story. After the Matrix trilogy ended, the Wachowskis stated that they wished the narrative to pass off to the audience, to players of the online game The Matrix Online, rather than it being owned and controlled by them, singular authors. When you uh, make movies and you, uh, it's this public art form, I think any kind of art that you put out into the universe, there's a letting go process um, because it's entering into like public dialogue. Uh, I like that, that uh, there's like an evolution process that um, we as human beings engage in art in a non-linear way that we can always like talk about something in, in, in new ways and in new light. Sadly, Warner Brothers had other ideas forcing resurrections to be made, so that sharing of narrative is now reflected in the ubiquitizing of the one role between not only Neo and Trinity, but everyone within the Matrix, as implied by the film's ending. But all this is what we actually already knew. Going back to The Matrix Reloaded, the architect revealed that Neo was not actually the first, the one, but that he was the latest version of an anomaly that kept recurring. You are the eventuality of an anomaly which, despite my sincerest efforts, I have been unable to eliminate from what is otherwise a harmony of mathematical precision. While it remains a burden assiduously avoided, it is not unexpected and thus not beyond a measure of control. While the Matrix attempted to control the One, it's telling that no matter what, human beings will always start to recognize that they are living in a controlled system, that the One is inevitable, and that Neo was never unique, but actually ubiquitous, a theme which Resurrections further elaborates and expounds upon with Trinity gaining the same types of powers. The One is not one, but many. We were on our way to remake your world. Change a few things. I kind of like the paint the sky with rainbows idea. Just remind people what a free mind can do. I forgot. It's easy to forget. He makes it easy. That he does. Something you should think about. Before we got started, we decided to stop by to say thank you. You gave us something we never thought we could have. 
And what is that? Another chance. I love this ending. Not the least of which is that it allows a woman to fly too. I mean, a woman who just found her true self. So back to that trans reading there. But I also think in the end, it allows Resurrections to be a more natural ending to the Matrix story than any other. Here, Neo and Trinity have the ability to recreate the Matrix both. And they help people recognize that they can create something new. They can envision something new instead of just being stuck in that cycle of looking towards the past and recreating the past. And just trying to fight for that thing that we never can actually have again. Resurrections is saying that while we may be caught in yet another loop of capitalism, things have changed, things have progressed, there is something new in this loop. And if we just nudge things forward, change things just a little bit with each loop, maybe we can change the system. At the end of Resurrections, the Matrix still exists and still needs to be defeated. But now, people can't deny that the Matrix exists. Everyone will have to recognize that the system is real. You can't just take the blue pill anymore. And by doing so, it robs the Matrix of its power. There is an alternative. We just have to envision it. So that's my reading on Resurrections as a whole. Again, there's a lot more in there, but that's my basic reading of Resurrections. But I want to end this video more as a sort of step back to talk about how Resurrections was received. Because I think how Resurrections was received by the viewing public also kind of speaks to what this movie was trying to say. You see, the anger and vitriol and dislike of this film has been deeply overwhelming. And on one hand, I get it. Like Reloaded and Revelations before, Resurrections was much more interested in its ideas, metaphors, and philosophy than in its minute-to-minute -minute story. It's a thought-provoking film, and that's why I love it, but it also has that messy, kind of lazy-looking action. And even if I think that that diluted action was intentional, it still means it's diluted action, and that's less interesting to watch. And while the relationship between Neo and Trinity is interesting within the film, it does often feel a little bit cold and distant and kind of a second thought to the overall ideas in the film. The characters also feel like they're written more like vehicles for ideas than full people. And so, on the one hand, I totally get people who came out of this movie feeling like it wasn't a good movie. And that's entirely valid for the, all those reasons. Yet, I also feel like there were people who were criticizing Resurrections for the exact thing that it was actually breaking down. People yelled that this was a nostalgia bait film, it was fan wanking, when the whole movie was about tearing that idea down and deconstructing it. And on one hand, that could be a failure of this movie to communicate its ideas effectively, and again, that's a valid reading, but I also think it speaks to the ongoing issue that we continually have with media literacy. I think our culture today has not trained people to actually think or read deeply about the media we consume, especially when it comes to blockbusters. Sure, there's indie films that often get well-documented readings that have deeper insight into them, but that's because indie film is often only seen by film fans who are used to interpreting film. But blockbuster movies are made to be widely consumable, easily understood, and disposable. And that's the entire point of them. That's what they're made to do, to just make you spend the money and not think about them. To just feel that sweet, sweet nostalgia. So I feel like when movies like Resurrections comes along, it only gets a surface reading because we have not trained people to understand how these films work. The sheeple aren't going anywhere. They like my world. They don't want this sentimentality. They don't want freedom or empowerment. They want to be controlled. They crave the comfort of certainty. And I'm not calling people stupid, so please don't misinterpret me as saying people are too dumb to get it, they just don't understand. There's a difference between not being given the tools to understand a film and not being smart enough. And I honestly think most people are smart enough, but we're intentionally not asked to use our brains to just take our pills and slip into just watching the thing. Because that would mean recognizing the system if we didn't. But the Matrix movies demand to be read deeper, and they're not exactly subtle, but they do require seeing more than just the surface. But as a result, unless there's a trans woman literally in a rainbow flag beating you over the head with the idea in the film, there will be people who deny that the Matrix is a capitalist metaphor, that the Matrix is a trans metaphor. That's not because people are dumb, but because they aren't asked to question deeper than the surface. But there's even more to it than that. It's not just people not liking the film, but that there was an incredibly vitriolic and angry reaction to Resurrections. There was outright 
hatred for this movie, and people who were gleefully delighted who saw that this film failed. And in many ways, as I spoke about before, it's a reflection of what happens when we see so many of these movies get vitriolic reactions. That it's too woke, that it's gone SJW, that it was trans people's fault that this movie wasn't good, we ruined it with our political agenda. And again, I'm not saying that every movie that people hate is somehow a secret masterpiece, but every film today seems to have that vitriolic reaction to it, to have that wokeness label put onto it. And it's because that vitriolic reaction is intentionally stoked by this nostalgia and anger and uncertainty by the binary nature of our discourse, but also, most importantly, by the fact that that lack of looking deeper in media is the same issue we have with ourselves. We aren't asked to be introspective in our personal lives and our society. We don't wish to question ourselves or the world in which we live. We seek certainty, and so to question our identity, the flaws that we may have, or the way in which we may hurt others, causes us concern. And so instead, we dive back into seeing a nostalgic view of the past, where things were perfect, where there wasn't all this discourse and anger and hatred. We dive back into movies, TV shows, and ourselves, and our view of the world, and we react in anger to any perspective that may be challenging to that. While I take issue with how this conversation is framed, and I am frustrated by people's lack of willingness to question their own self, I understand why. It's because the system never asks us to question ourselves. It asks us to constantly take that blue pill, never change, because the system would be upset. This movie was made by a trans woman, and even if it wasn't politically charged as this movie was, I feel like it would have automatically been placed as a woke movie simply by who was making it. It's the same thing that happens here on my channel. I'm seen as a woke channel just whenever I'm talking about anything, just because I'm a trans woman in a video, even if I'm not talking about politics in the video at all. And again, I'm not here to yell about anti-SJW channels because, as Resurrection points out, I don't view anti-SJW channels or people railing against wokeness in media as my enemy or the antagonist here. They're people who recognize the problem, but try to blame the wrong people, and whose emotions are being manipulated and pushed in the wrong direction to create a hyperbolic culture war. Also, it's worth mentioning that something I haven't really touched upon is how the Matrix movies handled race. There are out there and have been a ton of discussions about the failures of the Wachowski siblings in handling race across their entire filmography, like their usage of dreadlocks and yellowface in the movie Cloud Atlas. And I think it's important that if I'm here praising these films and their themes and ideas, that I also point you towards criticism of these issues within them. Yet I am not the voice that should be centered in those combos, so I'm going to actually point you to the wonderful YouTuber Aranok, who is a great creator who soon after this video releases will be releasing a video of their own that they have worked on with numerous folks to share both praise and criticism of the Matrix movies, as well as more discussion of the franchise's trans themes. I'll be sharing that video in the description when it releases, it's not out at the time of this video's release, but you should all subscribe to Aranok's channel so you don't miss it because it's going to be a banger. And I'm personally very excited to hear the folks that she has pulled together to talk about some of the really problematic issues within the Matrix movies. In fact, I think it's a necessary watch after my own video, as it's part of the point that I'm making here. When we critically analyze works of art, most people expect that analysis to end with thing good or thing bad, often distilling it to a single verifiable number on Rotten Tomatoes or a review score. While I don't mind that in the context of creating a space for someone to figure out if a work of art is worth their limited time and money, when doing larger critical analyses, art cannot and should not be distilled so easily. To do so falls into that very limited, shallow analysis that I've been critical of this entire video. To fall into thing good or thing bad leads to that very binarized thinking that puts people into seeing the world as us versus them, rather than engaging with art, creators, and whole people as complex beings that are often contradictory, praiseworthy, and problematic at the same time. And not just within art, but in everything, from politics to just engaging within your community. So I think it's deeply important to acknowledge that while I'm praising the Matrix franchise and Resurrections as a work of art, and the Wachowskis are literally two of my favorite filmmakers, that they and their work has a lot of issues and problems within it. No art is perfect. But talking about these issues can sometimes lead to just as much, if not more, thoughtful engagement than praising something can. And that should extend to all creators, even myself. I'm sure I've said things in this or other videos that you've disagreed with, hated, or even found intensely problematic. I myself look back at some videos and cringe at a lot of my takes, and there's been some jokes that I have done that are intensely problematic and I'm deeply ashamed of and take full ownership of. 
But let's talk about that. Let's engage with that. Hold me and others accountable, yes, but canceling is a silly narrative that feeds into this right-wing rhetoric and worldview. It's why when I've discussed specific creators in this video and elsewhere, even folks who I find to be incredibly harmful, I hold them accountable, but I never question their humanity or need to live without harassment. Any use of a specific creator in this video was done to show the dynamic they represent not to attack that person. No one is perfect, except for Keanu Reeves. He is perfect. It's awesome. You think it's awesome? I mean, it's awesome. I mean, it's yeah. awesome. Yeah. I mean, Dear God, please don't let that joke age like milk, please, for the love of Keanu. But even further, it's worth noting the larger context that the Matrix movies sit within. Because the imagery of the original Matrix trilogy was co-opted by the alt-right. The image of the red pill back around eight or nine years ago was taken by groups like 4chan or Reddit or other alt-right groups to mean things like you're realizing that feminism is actually destroying society in your life. That it was actually women or minorities like trans people are actually causing the harm. <laughs> and then eventually the red pill became a symbol for conservative ideology in general. Again, how capitalism takes these things and makes them trivial, distorts their meaning. And it's funny that the red pill became the symbol of that because there were people who saw themselves as Neo in the Matrix. That they were taking the red pill and thinking that they were realizing that they were in the Matrix. When in actuality, they were Agent Smith. Someone who has certainly been harmed by the system, but sees those pushing back against the system by pointing out some of the privileges that they have under the system as the real root of the problem. Instead of realizing that we're actually allies in the fight, all this also goes back to the idea of the character of George we spoke about earlier, who recognized the surface level interpretation of the Matrix games within Resurrections and was a fan of Neo's work in this new Matrix, but we later learn that George is actually an agent of the Matrix, a handler of Neo for the analysts sent to spy on him. That'll be Jude. He's not your friend, he's a handler program used to control you. He's on his way here and he's bringing agents with him. This reflects how many alt-right groups co-opted and misunderstood the themes and ideas of the original Matrix due to their very surface level reading. In fact, Agent Smith actor Hugo Weaving was asked about this very dynamic a few years ago. There was a group at the Black Lives Matter protests that were up against the BLM protesters with their guns. And two or three of those guys were wearing V for Vendetta masks. And I was like, wow man, that couldn't be more opposite of what it stands for. The original V was based on Guy Fox, and these guys were trying to blow up the House of Parliament. They were young Catholic protesters who were being prosecuted by their government, trying to rebel against that and taking very violent course of action to make their cause. To me, that mask has always represented questioning the government. And somehow now it's guys who are generally unhappy with what's going on, or guys who think they look cool. The same with the Matrix. There is something to do with looking cool and black with a gun. And then you can go into a school and shoot people, and somehow you're immune from the consequences of that because you feel like you're cool. You feel like you're V, or you look like you're Neo or something. It's a very, very shallow reading of the intention of a film. That's a problem with popular culture. These films are profoundly thought through, but it's too easy to look cool and have a cool haircut and have a gun, and you think that's all you need to do in life. But you haven't thought about what that gun is for, and what that haircut is for and what those black clothes are meant to be. What are you trying to do all this for? Is it all narcissism and ego? Or is it about community and thinking about what's right for other people? When you get such a split in society, it's because there isn't the leadership at the top. They aren't thinking about other people and are only thinking about themselves. And it's important to recognize that the same dynamic that I spoke about with film and pop culture is the same one that's present in politics, but the stakes are obviously much higher. A lot of this happens because people have not been asked to be politically literate, have not been given the tools to be able to critically analyze news, discourse, and political rhetoric. And it's the failure of the leaders at the top to not only fail to supply those tools, but take advantage of that gap in knowledge to fill it with their own manipulations to hold on to power by stoking and fueling division and economic anxiety. All the while, they fail to speak to anything meaningful that people are dealing with or feeling, instead stoking culture war rhetoric that just leads to division and strife that only leads to their own power and gain. And so it's mildly comical that a film franchise about recognizing that power structure instead got reused and repurposed to reinforce it exactly like the Matrix Resurrections set out to deconstruct. But this is also why, while I recognize the danger of the alt-right and understand that they need to be fought and pushed back against, how I also feel a sense of understanding of them. Because while they do enact harm on those who are beneath them, they do so because they see themselves as feeling pressure from both sides. 
they are also hurt by the system. So I will fight them, but I don't hate them. And the fight against them is part of what shapes us, how we react to them. It's important to note that Morpheus in Resurrections, the version of Morpheus that we see in the movie, is actually not Morpheus at all. He's an amalgam of both Morpheus and Agent Smith. Is that you wrote me as an algorithmic reflection of two forces that helped you become you. Morpheus and Agent Smith. A combo pack of counter-programming that was... Let's just say more than a little crazy making. They're the two people who helped to shape Neo. Because in many ways, the fight between those two helps inform our fight against the greater system. And so that's why I wanted to end on this, because the exact systems that the Matrix Resurrections tried to make us recognize are the exact same ones that it as a film in the discourse fell victim to. If the original Matrix was a reflection of the time in which it came out, and Reloaded and Revolutions were prescient warnings of what was to come under that system, I think Resurrections is something a bit more interesting. It's a mirror to today, but it also offers us a way out. If we ignore the hyperbolic world around us and seek each other out, find community and fight for a future together instead of yearning for a past that never existed, we can paint the sky with rainbows and see a more beautiful future. There is an alternative. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you all enjoyed it as well as my fun little cosplays that I did throughout this video. Um, few important announcements. In fact, the first most important announcement that I'm really excited to finally say with this video, I am now officially on Nebula. I am so excited that I got asked to be a part of this and I'm with a group of creators where we decided to try to create a platform that wouldn't have to deal with the dreaded algorithm here on YouTube. Also, really quickly, I'm cutting away from me and all that fun leather Matrix cosplay to this shot because I realized as I was editing that because I was in that sort of Matrix cosplay leather stuff that I kind of got all excited because Jesse gets excited when she's wearing a bunch of fun, sexy leather, that um, I forgot to say something that was actually kind of really important to me to say with this Nebula announcement that I wanted to just make really, really clear here. This announcement of me being able to be on Nebula on a personal level, I, I'm just really so honestly relieved about this because being able to branch out on Nebula is just honestly a way for me to feel safer in my career as a creator, having multiple platforms to rely on instead of, you know, just this one here on YouTube. And while I'm not here to vilify YouTube, I think all of us kind of know that it's a little bit of a scary place for a lot of us creators trying to make a living on here for numerous reasons. Some, you know, just part of the game, some that are unique to YouTube and things like that. But, you know, it is kind of scary to be reliant on this platform. And so to have this chance on Nebula, uh, and I'm not just saying this as a marketing thing, it's honestly really important to me to have this little bit of extra life security with this. It's also really important to me, not just on a life, you know, getting to live level, but it's also stuff like this that allows me to take creative risks and chances with the stuff that I do to trust my own creative voice a bit more and, and that voice that helps me make videos like this Matrix one rather than, you know, that other voice that I sometimes have in my head that's, you know, constantly whispering in my ear that I need to think only about what's going to help make me pay the bills. You know, that always having to be the first and foremost thing rather than getting to branch out creatively. And so I wanted to say that, but the thing that I really, really wanted to say that I, I wanted to make expressly clear with this is that me getting to do that, me getting to be on Nebula is all thanks to you. I'm not just saying that as like, a, oh, you did it. You thank you so much, community. No, I, I'm being very earnest and honest here that the reason I got to be on Nebula was foremost one the community that has been created on this channel that i am so thankful and honored by that you are all a part of but also more specifically if we want to talk about a direct causal link um 
last month I did my first video in the Sex and Star Trek series, a video that I knew was a creative gamble, that I didn't know was going to work out, that I didn't know was going to be a big thing. I mean, it's like a three hour long video about a niche topic within a niche topic. But I also knew that it was a video that I really wanted to do. It was one that was very meaningful for me to do for a bunch of different reasons. And if you saw the video, you can kind of see why. So it was really a passion project for me. And, and it's the video that I am most proud of, I think, of in my entire career, at least in terms of talking about nerd stuff. And what I was most surprised by was that you all supported it much more than I ever expected it to be supported. And that meant so much to me. And then a few days after it went up, as some of you know, it got flagged by YouTube and got hidden and demonetized and all that fun stuff. And I won't go through the whole rigmarole of it again and go through all the specific beats in the story. But long story short, I shared my fears and sadnesses and frustration about what was happening. And because of that, all of you, the community responded not only with kindness and support, but with outspoken frustration alongside me. And because of that, that directly, and I, and I know for a fact that this is true, that outspokenness was what got me noticed by the people at Nebula. And because they noticed, because of all of you talking about this, they not only helped me get my Sex and Star Trek video back to being fully monetized and viewed and unhidden and all that stuff, and, and got the attention of YouTube and, and connected with people at YouTube who can help with that, not only on that video, but hopefully in the future if it ever happens again, which by the way, then helped propel that video to over 100K views, which is where it's sitting at right now, which I am kind of mind boggled at that, by the way. I, I can't believe that that video has hit that many views and I'm, I'm so thankful for that. But from there, the people at Nebula offered me a chance to be on Nebula. And it's given me the chance to be able to connect with creators and people that I never in my life expected to call peers. People that I have looked up to for so long on YouTube and Nebula and other places that I'm now saying, like, I can talk to and actually, you know, have a community with. I, I don't feel like I've earned it <laughs> at all. I, it's kind of surreal to me, but I, I am so thankful for it. And that directly directly is because of all of you. So thank you. Thank you truly and honestly for all that you've done for me. And I just wanted to make that expressly clear with this announcement. So thank you for all of that. And I should say, don't worry, this won't affect this YouTube channel. I'm not going to like leave YouTube for Nebula or anything like that. I'm still going to be releasing the bulk of my videos on both here and on Nebula. For the most part, Nebula is going to be just another place for people to find my work, for me to have more financial stability, and for me to take uh, more creative risks with the resources and connections that Nebula is hopefully going to uh, provide me with over the coming months and years as I continue on this crazy journey that I call my professional life. Um, that being said, I do have some plans to make some Nebula exclusive content, but I'll let you know if and when that rolls out and what that's going to be and what that's going to look like, and I'm kind of excited about it, but I'll make sure I can try and communicate that as clearly as I can. And as always, the best place to support me beyond YouTube and Nebula is still my Patreon. I'm going to post everything that I do on my Patreon. And so that's still the best place to directly support me and everything that I do and also make sure that you don't miss any of the stuff that I'm going to be doing. So um, those are sort of the three major platforms, YouTube, Nebula, and then Patreon is, again, what just directly um, allows me to pay my bills. So thank you, especially to my patrons and all of this. You are the heart and soul of this community. I know that that was really long and a little bit indulgent, but I felt that it was necessary for me to say I really wanted to say it with this announcement about Nebula, so I just wanted to be clear about that. So sorry that I didn't say it in the sexy leather cosplay outfit, um, but you still got to see my beautiful face, so I hope that was, uh, was enough for you. But anyways, back to the leather outfit to wrap out the video. Beyond all of that, uh, just a few things that I wish to say about this video. I know there were things that I missed when it came to Matrix Resurrections. Uh, there were issues of aspects of trauma loops that the film addresses, issues of race. I also didn't talk about issues like uh, Zion versus Io in the film, or whatever the hell the Marovincian was doing in this movie, or how Keanu Reeves is amazing, and, and all that stuff. Uh, but this video was already long as it is, but there is much more to dissect with this film, and it's why I think Resurrections is a truly amazing movie that needs to be discussed for years and decades to come, 
just as much, if not more so, than all the other Matrix movies. But I damn sure thought it was one of the most interesting movies I saw in 2021. And I really hope that other movies get this type of budget and skill behind it in order to make it. But beyond all of that, uh, thank you so much for watching this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I also have a Patreon that helps supporting me doing what I do. Uh, it helps me, this is my full-time job, so it, all of you who help me out on Patreon or uh, subscribe on Nebula, um, it does actually legitimately pay my bills and allow me to do big, weird, and strange videos like this and also make costumes like this where I get to show off the girls for all of you. I know some of you are looking. It's fine. You can look respectfully. Um, so yeah, thank you so much to all my patrons. I love you and adore you and I couldn't do it without you. Um, but thank you so much for watching and as always, live long and prosper. Thank you so much for my patrons. I absolutely love you and adore you. Thank you for helping me pay my bills. Thank you for helping me do this job. I could not do this without you and I adore you so much. And an extra special thank you to... Morgan the Pirate Creek, Joe Herman Holt, Louise Howard, Eliza Tantivy, Miranda Janelle, Catherine Lambeth, Ashley Allen, Bo Kiki, Yo, Stephen Clenard, Jem Shin, Ish the Mad, Mary Mello, Matt Chung, Keith Feemster, Randy Thompson, Wellington Marcus, Boyd and Mary Beth Earl, Vincent Ellington D. Cassaray, Chloe Dollar, G Man 42, Joseph Dewey, Felicia Toast, Sylvester Rauchout, Natalie Fortune, James Cribden, Alex Miller, Teresa Elizabeth Christensen, Barbara Ruski, Dominic Noble, A Man Chooses, A Slave Obeys, Jennifer Russ, Someone Librarian, Jessica Wright, Sunk Corgi, Sonia Nero Perdo, Nathaniel Fronten, Peter Lander, Jared Johnson, Franga Toe, Celestial Dawn, Wen Dizzle Bizzle, Geek Filter, Mountain Harpy, Jose Alfredo Villalobos, The Oath of Boyd, Pissed and Twisted Garage, Ulysses the Pagan, Melinda Walters, Meadow Whisper, W. Randy, E. D. John Weatherby, Stephen Richardson, Kevin Freite, Alex Owen, All the Tribbles Sing, Beatrix Purvis, Bass, Lysa, Casual Observer, Maggie the Goblin, Tiffany Danger, Cause I've Got Faith of the Heart, Odd Just Odd, Flynn, Sarah Leslie Hutchkins, Lamia, Jessica Chapman, Gretchen Badger, William Stewart, Sarah Lamoureau, Eva Caniva, Sarah Bystam, Jacob Tober, Melody Ann Winters Good, Noble Monster Comics, Laura Demereau, Jess Johnson, Kayliss, Sky Sinner, Nathan Steele, Jason Knott, Sean Piper, Fit7, Spooky Heather, Sylvia, Hierisis Blue, Maeve Troy Stahl, Andrew K, Strawberry Pup Dark, Crit Fax, Nikki Gordon Bloomfield, Polly Mina, Angie Pugh, Manir Amlani, Michael Godey, Jenny Marble, Pasty, Elijah M, Ver, Andy H, Corey and Vale, Honkinen. Love you all. You're the best. Mwah. Thank you for being beautiful.